Today's Jeep Talk Show is brought to you by ExtremeTerrain.com, leaders in 1987 to 2018 Wrangler parts and accessories. Stay tuned to later in this episode for their latest announcement, featuring their JK versus JL slider comparison, or click the link in this week's show notes for more information. Today's Jeep Talk Show is also sponsored in part by Tom Woods Custom Drive Shafts. For over 20 years, Tom Woods has been providing the off-road industry with some of the strongest, most durable driveline upgrades there is. If you're in need for the world's best under your Jeep, stay tuned later for the show to find out how you can get 10% off your order between now and the end of June. Until then, head over to www.4xshaft.com to start upgrading your ride now. Oh, and check that purchase when it arrives for a bright, shiny new Jeep Talk Show sticker. And don't forget about Route 16 Off-Road. Veteran-owned and operated and community-focused brand Route 16 Off-Road works real hard to get you the best deals possible on the parts and accessories you want. Let Route 16 help you find that next replacement part or upgrade. Check them out. Route16.com. That's R-O-O-T-O-N-E-S-I-X.com. You're listening to a 4x4, 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the G Talk Show. With Tammy on Wrangler. Tony and Josh on Cherokee. So sit back. Strap in. And brace yourself. Uh, anybody there? Tony? Is, is that you? No, Josh, that's the empty space Tammy would uh, you know normally be occupying. Uh, but she had something important to do, as usual, and is unable to be here. What, again? Well, so how many days off can I take then? Well, I think it's a maximum of three weeks, uh, but you have to go through HR, and HR is always closed. Oh, clear as mud. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so anyway, really, uh, honestly, you get no days off. Uh, it's in the contract. You should check it. And uh, now shut up and get back to work. Local Jeep news, national Jeep news, and news from around the world. It's This Week in Jeep. And This Week in Jeep is brought to you by Amazon.com. Want to celebrate quitting your job or your podcast? Well, Amazon just <laughs> has, the, has the stuff that you need. In all seriousness, folks, if you want the best deals on, well, pretty much anything and you want it right now, then head over to JeepTalkShow.com. No, we don't sell a single thing there, but you will find a button there that will take you to Amazon.com where anything you buy using that button will have a small percentage of your total purchase donated to the Jeep Talk Show. You don't pay anything extra, and it's a great way to help out. And thanks in advance. Well, the next five years for Jeep and FCA have some really big plans involved. With FCA's recent announcement of having more cash than debt by the end of this month, you'd think that the stock market would have responded positively. Unfortunately, the stock market rarely does what we expect it to, and thus it was a huge shock to everyone, including soon to retire CEO Sergio Marchione, when after the announcement of FCA's well, after the, after the announcement, FCA's stock prices fell a substantial 7.2%. Marcion said he was puzzled by the stock drop, asking whether he had issued, issued any bad news or not. Well, if you remember, in recent weeks, it was more or less leaked that after his retirement, there would likely be a juggling of brands under the FCA umbrella, and that even, after, and even a merger wasn't entirely out of the question. But through all of that, Jeep would become the focal point of the automaker going so far as to announce the end of fiat sales in the U.S. in the coming years and the, confi the confinement of Chrysler to North America. There's also been official confirmation that Jeep will be rolling out hybrids as early as next year and full electrics in the coming years. In fact, head of the Jeep brand Mike Manley just announced that Jeep's entire lineup will be electrified in some fashion by 2022 with 10 plug-in hybrids and four full electric models. Other rumors that have now been verified as fact in the recent five-year plan press conference last week are mid-sized Ram pickup that will be offered pretty soon, likely piggybacking on the upcoming Jeep pickup platform is what I'm guessing, as well as a three-row Grand Cherokee that's in the works and the beginning of a phase-out of all diesel passenger car production in Europe by 2021. Yeah, that's pretty major right there. Marcion specifically blamed the useless overregulation of emission standards, which overall has shifted consumer attitudes enough to force this bold decision. Now, the brand will also launch subscription and mobility services in North America to allow Jeep fans full access to its models. 
The exact details of this have yet to be announced, though. Jeep will also begin offering use-based insurance coverage in the coming years, important for off-roaders and fleet management. All in all, it's one of the most ambitious five-year plans to come out of the FCA Jeep camp, and it looks like the brand is going to have a very bright future, especially if we can get Mike Manley in to take the CEO role after Marcion steps down. That's what I'm rooting for. So I don't know about the the regulations and the, the diesel uh, phase out. I, I, I just think that's, in general, a bad idea. Now, remember, that's a phase out in Europe, not in the U.S., where we've been, you know, all but on our hands and knees begging for more diesel from Jeep. This is a kind of an interesting turn because that, I mean, historically has been, you know, what it powers the, the you know, most of the vehicles over there. You know, they're, they're way more diesel than we are over here. And so to, to pretty much phase out your entire diesel lineup in all of Europe is a major decision. To think about, you know, that's a lot of R&D, that's a lot of manufacturing, that's a lot of jobs that are no longer going to be there. Well, you know, if you're lucky enough, and I realized it, it, you did say it was in Europe, uh, if you're lucky enough to be in a place where you can get a diesel in your automobile or uh, Jeep or whatever, <laughs> it just, it's just sad that it's going away. And, and you know, I'm a little surprised too about the 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 uh, stock price uh, dropping, especially that much. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we you've reported some bad news here recently about FCA numbers, and the only bright shiny spots were the the two they were talking about spinning off Jeep and Ram. So um, I guess so. If you're if you're gonna <laughs> be losing the golden goose, so to speak, uh, it's best to get out now. But if there's a merger, I thought it was always good to have stock if there was a merger because. Uh, you get some uh, a bonus for that. I mean, if, if they're paying more for the stock than what it's worth. Well, not only that, it also gives you a little bit of leverage in that kind of a deal. I mean, th- there's a lot under the FCA, FCA umbrella. It's a lot more than just Fiat and Chrysler. Obviously, we have Jeep and, and Ram is in there as well, but you also got Maserati and, uh, and uh, there's a couple others in there as, as well. Big European automotive companies. Um, now, obviously, you know, what happens with them doesn't necessarily have a direct effect over on uh, on us over here in the in the United States. Obviously, not everybody's driving Maseratis, so you know how that's going to play out is going to be interesting. Really, what's going to be interesting is is this new focus on Jeep, or I think we're going to see really this. You know, I've been talking about Jeep taking over the world for the last couple of years now with their you know their global takeover plan that they've got. You know, selling Jeeps globally more and more and more. I think we're going to start to see that being implemented a lot more now than we ever have before. Yeah, probably so. Well, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens and uh, just listen for it here to keep up to date with uh, all things uh, going on with Jeep. Indeed. Well, speaking of the Jeeps, uh, how about the new 2018 Wrangler JL? And it was announced that when the new Wrangler JL was to launch, it was going to have an unprecedented line of aftermarket inspired factory-built accessories to go behind it for dealers to sell and install. Now, this week, details from the recent dealers' convention showcased the over 200-some-odd parts, mods, upgrades, and accessories. The expanded lineup included a plethora of Jeep performance parts, even for the JL Wrangler. Now we're talking. Now, they didn't forget about us more off-road-minded folks, either. Just some of the new factory-built parts you can get include a very capable 2-inch suspension lift, how about a worn winch or brand new offerings made specifically for the JL Wrangler, including a never-before-seen roof rack and a tailgate table? A smorgasbord of accessories from Mopar, FCA's in-house parts and service brand, result from hard lessons learned in the wake of Chrysler's 2009 bankruptcy. When Fiat took over the U.S. automaker, Mopar head Pietro Gorlier ex- quickly noticed that the aftermarket suppliers dominated the estimated $6 billion annual market for Wrangler accessories alone, the largest accessories market for any SUV, according to the Specialty Equipment Market Association, or SEMA, leaving Mopar basically with just table scraps. Now, Gorlier it launched an effort to develop a line of Wrangler accessories in-house. When sold by a dealership, these accessories could be ordered and installed from the factory, or could be installed by the de- dealership and financed as part of the vehicle loan. A lot of you JK owners out there know about this program. Now, because the Mopar accessories were factory authorized, they keep the vehicle's factory warranty intact. Very important for a lot of you JK owners back in the days when, in the early days when it first came out. Now, Gorlier also said last year that 98% of Wrangler vehicles are customized with at least one product from the Mopar portfolio, and that Mopar has worked extensively with Wrangler owners over the recent past 
to develop accessories specifically for the off-roaders. Now, in, November, in November, Mopar revealed a number of Wrangler accessories. Some were large or complex, such as first-ever roof rack, enabling owners to carry bicycles, snowboards, kayaks, and other large equipment above their vehicles, and an auxiliary switch bank for the instrument panel that lets owners centralize control of electrical accessories, such as additional lights or winch controls, without compromising the vehicle's electrical system or instrument panel. And again, all while keeping the warranty. Now, others were simple, such as the tailgate table or infotainment touchscreen protector. If you're wondering what this new line of warranty-saving mods are going to cost you, well, sticker prices range from just a few dollars, actually, to several thousand. It all depends on what you're getting. Now, Tony, I don't know if you've seen pictures of any of these accessories out there. Some of the, uh, some of the dealers actually have, um, have opted for the, the factory-authorized display that actually showcases all of these different, uh, the different accessories and stuff. And it is impressive. I will say that. So I've never understood, um, I don't know, maybe it's brand loyalty or something. I've never understood why it is that you can, you have to pay so much for modifications that the, uh, the, the company that built the, the, the vehicle in this case, uh, so much more than aftermarket. And, and often too, the quality is much better from the aftermarket. So not only are you getting uh, charged much, too much, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, you're also getting uh, uh, something that's not as good as something from the aftermarket. I, I don't really understand the thought process there. Well, it's not so much a thought process as it's just plain logistics. And we'll go back to some of the numbers we were talking about earlier. And it really, the Wrangler accessories market, I think that just a couple of years ago was $5 billion. Now it's over, I think, 6 or $7 billion. Now, back in 2006, 2007, um, when the JK was, you know, starting to see its growth and whatnot, it, you know, all of the accessories and whatnot that were coming out were really, you, you had all of that aftermarket support. You had $6 billion of R&D and years and years and years of aftermarket R&D and, and customers feedback and whatnot. The factories don't have that. They just plain and simply only have their engine development, their, their factory development, the, you know, how the vehicle is built and whatnot, how it's then accessorized or modified or upgraded from the customer for better off-road capability or you know, just plain customization was something that was never really addressed because the aftermarket was so prevalent. It was right. so there. And how do you compete against a $6 billion industry? So, you know, there was sort of this one guy who s stepped up to the plate and was like, look, we need to get a piece of this pie. There's $6 billion out there. We can get a percentage of that because right now, as, you, as we heard, it was just table scraps before. So they stepped up to the plate. They, they initiated this program with factory authorized, off-road inspired modifications and, and accessories and upgrades to the JK platform, which enabled you to keep your factory warranty, but get you some of that, you know, that that flair and that personalization and customization and and of course the modification to get you the the upgrades and whatnot as well now they're taking that to a whole new level with this jl well as well they should and and you know maybe i'm wrong uh as far as what they're going to be charging for these things uh it, it generally though they're they want more than what it's worth to me personally especially when i can find it cheaper someplace else yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen these in person yet. Uh, my my Jeep dealership out here certainly doesn't have this large display, and and I don't I don't think many of the dealerships are going to have you know the entire accessory line in stock. You know, it's going to be one of these things where it can be ordered. You know, that sort of thing. But it is it, it they are attacking this sort of twofold. You can either have your Jeep custom built with these accessories. Or you can have the dealership do it and work it into the finance and whatnot. So, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is really, really driven towards the consumer. And Jeep has really shown that in 2018 with a lot of these, you know, consumer-focused types of accessories that really show that they've been listening. Yeah, well, it's obvious they're doing a much better job of uh, listening to, the, uh, to their target audience, uh, even with uh, what we saw with the, uh, the, the new Cherokee. Um, they, uh, that certainly has been a winner for them. I am glad they changed the headlights on those things though. It looks a lot more like a grand Cherokee <laughs> now than, uh, uh, than, uh, which I've always thought the grand Cherokee was a, was a very, uh, a pretty vehicle. Um, uh, much more so these days, but definitely not what I would consider an off-road vehicle. 
Yeah, no, I've seen a couple out here recently that have uh, had some nice, uh, some nice mods, newer Grand Cherokees that have you know a little bit, a uh, little bit of a lift and a little bit of uh, larger tires on them. God, they look good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, well, like you said, you know, Jeep's been listening and and they're really, uh, really uh, helping us consumers out with you know, modifying our Jeeps. Well, hey, if you guys have a news tip or a response to any one of our stories, we'd like to hear from you. Be sure to let us know what you're thinking or what you found out in the out in the news world by phone or by email. You can reach out reach out to us a number of ways. Just go over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact, and you can find out all the ways to reach out and say hi. And coming up later in the show, uh, we interview with Ocean State Jeepsters. We got a little bit of a substitution. We're supposed to have J.J. Sylvia in with us, but Eric got in uh, last minute. We're going to have him up here in just a little bit for a really great interview with a really great Jeep club. This is Steve, 4.3 LXJ, with another Jeep tip. And I'd like to continue our series on the Dana 30 front end. And we sort of went over the gross anatomy of them and uh, where they first appeared and they, uh, we did not go over the uh, spindle versus the unit bearing uh, option, and we will have our own segment on that at a later time. But for now, I just want to take a look at the basic axle itself. It comes in two versions, what we call low pinion and high pinion. And if you've seen either one, you know the difference. And the way this came about was that front ends were all made Originally, just by taking the center section or the pumpkin, we call it, and they just turned it around and put different tubes on it, and it became a front axle instead of a rear axle. The uh, idea of a high pinion came about later, and there there are a couple of advantages to this, and uh, the uh, one is is that the gears have a what we call a reverse rotation. And in other words, we're applying pressure to the ring gear on the drive side now instead of the coast side. And you can look at pictures of ring and pinions and see the difference. And these uh, uh, gears, there's long been some stories about uh, one is stronger than the other. So I uh, wanted to find out the gist of it. And I contacted Randy's Worldwide. Now, Randy's Worldwide to some of us have been around is known as Randy's ring and pinion, but uh, they manufacture more than gears now for Yukon and they manufacture zip lockers and all kinds of stuff. So Randy's worldwide has been called that for about the last four years. And I actually talked to uh, the marketing manager, Brian Hollingsworth there and to Brian Hogeberg, who is an engineer and got the skinny on this uh, low pinion and high bit pinion business. And I've heard lots of stories that there's basically no difference to, yes, there is difference. And he said basically that the high pinion in the forward direction, in other words, you're climbing a hill with a high pinion, is 20 to 30% stronger due to the cut of the gears than the uh, standard uh, ring and pinion. So... Uh, I thought it might have been a myth, so I contacted the professionals and uh, the guys that actually design these things. And Brian, by the way, holds a couple of patents on ring and pinion gears, so uh, I'm going to take his word for it. 20 to 30% difference in strength between a low pinion and a high pinion. And with that, we'll carry on next time. And until then, we'll see you on the trail. My goodness, I had no idea there was a, a difference in strength. Had you heard that before, uh, Josh? I had heard rumors, uh, really nothing substantiated. I, I A lot of people say things, you know, it's like, well, okay, that yeah, there's always been about clearance, really, between the low oh, opinion yeah. and the high opinion. And and I've heard some stuff about, okay, the high opinion is a stronger axle, yada, yada, whatever. I, but I've never anything from somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. So that's <laughs> very interesting to hear. And in fact, some numbers on it as well, that we, for us gearheads out there, we can wrap our minds around some of those numbers. 20 to 30% stronger. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, who would have thunk it? Uh, it's uh, Just thinking about it, it doesn't uh, make a lot of sense to me. But since I have a high opinion, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> You know, it's sad that they uh, they went to the low pinion uh, because the 
uh, I think it was around 2000 for the uh, for the Cherokee uh, that they went to the the low pinion. Uh, and I'll, I noticed that the 2003 TJ we have is also a low pinion. So they probably made that switch, uh, you know, for the for both models at that same time. Uh, and it's just a shame, especially with a vehicle that you're going to lift, because if, if you're dealing with a high pinion, uh, your angle, your drive shaft angle is not going to be as much, and it's not going to be as much when you take it off road. So uh, I wonder what the story is behind uh, going with the, uh, the the low pinion over the high pinion. I have to get somebody from Dana. Yeah, that's uh, what I was on, just thinking. On the show, you know, we're going to say, all right, you know, we need an engineer. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Set us up. All right, Dana, if you're listening out there, uh, you got to have somebody give us a call. We'll have you. Your, your people need to call our people. Well, you know, I'm getting ready to start uh, uh, filling up July uh, for guests. Uh, we currently have one uh, scheduled for July, so there's uh, three more slots that I got to fill. Uh, so uh, maybe Dana will be on my list because I'd love to talk to somebody from Dana. Yeah, that'd be neat. They yeah. do make great Jesus. axles, by the way. Well, I mean, you know, no, really, no, hand, just hands down. I'd like to talk to them a little bit more in detail about this new generation of Dana. 30. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All spanking new guys. Not, not just sort of a fresh coat of paint. No, we'll, we'll throw a, a Dana 44 center section in that and call it good. No, this is a completely new design of Dana 30 and I'm really curious about it. So I want to get some numbers from somebody from Dana on that. If we can get that interview guys, that's going to be a good one. You'll have to watch out for that. So also too, and I don't know if they're able to talk about this or not. I'd like to know that during the development of the Dana 35, if there was any ever any loss of life from engineers from <laughs> Dana 35 is just <laughs> randomly exploding, exploding, you know, just grenading it's on like, the workbench. It's like they're mixing, you know, uh, TNT or something and like, uh, be careful with that. Don't shake it. <laughs> Was it the, the first one rolls off, uh, off the assembly line they got to test it. Okay. What's it capable of? Who's going to, who's going to put this thing through its paces? <laughs> hey, George, uh, we don't like you. Why don't you come over here and test it? Oh no. They get Chuck the- Yeager in <laughs> to test, test that the Dana 35. <laughs> <laughs> we need somebody with balls of steel and uh, the tested uh, uh, scary planes to, to test the Dana 35. <laughs> You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Hey, if you haven't been to the 4x4 Radio Network website lately, well, you're missing out, guys. Just head over to 4x4radionetwork.com, and you can listen to the 4x4 podcast or the Center Steer podcast. The Trail Chasers podcast is there, and our newest member on the Trail podcast is posting up new shows all the time. Need more off-road, con- off-road podcast content? Head over to 4x4radionetwork.com right now and get your fix. Shut up and listen. Shut up. So shut up. You don't shut up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler talk. It's time for G-Mama. Ooh, red Jeeps are sexy. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Tammy. I hope you're enjoying that graduation. (laughs) Josh is, I can see Josh on Skype. He's going, what the hell is he doing? We don't have a Wrangler talk segment tonight. Completely veered off the show notes. I'm like, what's going on here? Is he just hitting buttons with his forehead again? <laughs> no, I'm really happy that uh, it's a special time when one of your kids is graduating from high school, and oh, no. it's, it's How, you have to be there for that thing. I mean, of it, it's especially in Maryland; it's in the Constitution or something. You have to be so there for graduation. What, what, was she strong, or do you think the waterworks came? Oh, the waterworks came. You know, she had to have right. I, I just hope she's not. You? I just hope while, while they're handing him the diploma, she's not going. Are you sure? <laughs> 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 we need a recount over here uh, <laughs> uh it's pretty good pretty good all all in all in good fun though and uh and congratulations over to that household and another one uh, another one makes it through yep yep so uh and coming up later in the show you, you don't want to miss this uh and i really mean it because uh nikki g's done a little production for us and uh well it's gonna <gasps> be yeah yep yep coming later in the show nikki g don't you dare miss it so as you may know, we are now available on the Amazon Echo, also known as the Alexa. All you have to do is uh, go over there and, uh, well, something like this. Alexa, ask the Jeep Talk Show to play the latest episode. Welcome. You can listen to all the episodes of Jeep Talk Show, a Jeep podcast, including new episodes, as they are released. For now, you'll start with the most recent episode, but you can change by skipping forward or backward. You can even say how many episodes you'd like to skip. 
I mean, I can't tell you how cool this is. You don't even have to press a button. You don't have to know nothing about no podcasting. All you have to do is have an Amazon Echo set up in your house or even an app on your phone. And speaking of apps on your phone, that's how you enable the Jeep Talk Show app is by going to your uh, Alexa app on your phone, uh, enabling the Jeep Talk Show uh, application, uh, and then just go over there and tell Alexa to play it. Hey, and speaking of our Jeep Talk Show app, we do have an app for both the Android and the Apple device platforms, guys. So, And they are free. They work great. And it's the perfect way to listen to the show. So if the whole artificial intelligence thing scares the living you-know-what out of you, and uh, you know the whole voice <laughs> command thing is just a little too much, well, just download the app. It's free no matter which platform you're using, and you guys can get us. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Josh. We haven't mentioned that in a long time. And the thing that I like the best about it, uh, once you get it installed on your phone, you can go over there and tell it to download the latest three episodes. It doesn't matter if you got cell service uh, in the bathroom at work or not. <laughs> You'll have the latest three episodes on your phone and you can listen to it. And it works on tablets as well. So uh, however you like to uh, to listen. So it's a, it's a great way to consume the show. Hey, and speaking of the show and how you guys can get involved, of course, if uh, you guys want to leave us a review, you can do that a number of ways. And we love getting the feedback from you guys. Uh, really, pretty much anywhere you can find us, iTunes, Facebook, YouTube, I mean, anywhere you can find a review, find a place to leave a review, leave a comment. And of course, those five-star reviews, oh, we love those. And we got a new five-star review uh, this last week. Uh, Tony, who do we got? This is from Dwayne K, and that's uh, just the last initial, not K-A-Y. He's given us a five out of five stars. He says, great show. Just started listening about a month ago, working on listening to all the past shows. I'll apologize in advance for the, the first few episodes. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot, so I have my work cut out for me. Great information and hosts have good chemistry. And uh, then there's this hashtag that I can't really make out, Josh. It says Blue Jeeps Rock, Tony. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing because he does not drive a, a uh, red or a black Jeep. Uh, but, Dwayne, nonetheless, um, I, I like the color blue myself yeah, blue as nice. well. Uh, thanks for the five-star review and uh, taking the time to leave a comment. Really appreciate that. And as you guys know, White Castle fries only come in one size. But sliders can appear in multiple forms, as our friends over at Extreme Terrain have shown us today. Since the 2018 Jeep Wrangler is available in two different generational styles, both the JK and the JL, Extreme Terrain has created their very own unique sliders detailing these differences side by side. Now, wipe that drool from your mouth because we're not talking about cheeseburgers here, unfortunately. I am hungry, though. <laughs> Driving down the road at 50 miles per hour from a 50-foot glance, the JK and JL appear, well, pretty similar to the untrained eye. The truth is, there are many differences, which Extreme Terrain points out in their JK versus JL guide. The lights, the grill, fenders, vents, door handles, more, all of it has all been completely redesigned for the new JL. Sure, the seven bar grill remains consistent as it should, but the presence of an emblem is a huge tell-all when it comes to the differentiation. Visit Extreme Terrain's JK versus JL slider comparison today and you can slide it to the left, slide it to the right, but don't get these two gens crisscrossed. Check it out today at extremeterrain.com or the link in today's show notes at jeeptalkshow.com. Tom Woods has been doing only four-wheel drive drive shafts and slip yoke eliminators for 20 years. As an American-owned and operated company, they provide solutions trusted by your average weekend wheeler all the way to rock-crushing rigs at King of the Hammers. If you have a Jeep, Tom Woods Custom Drive Shaft is the, has a solution for you. Using their house-developed gold seal universal joints, you can count on the strength of your drive shaft at its weakest and most abused points. And if you're concerned about warranties, it just doesn't get any better than their trail hazard protection. If a weld ever breaks, they'll take care of it. If a gold seal universal joint breaks, they'll take care of it. But also any damage to the drive shaft. Those other companies just put a new joint in your hand and send you on your way. Tom Woods loves Jeeps. In fact, he has three highly modified Jeeps, so he understands the passion and so do his employees. Tom Woods Custom Drive Shafts are always shipped completed, balanced, greased, and ready to install. They pay attention to the finest details, so you're less likely to run into any issues. If you've ever experienced a drive shaft failure, failure, you know how important it is to have this quality. When you research custom drive shafts, there is just one name that tops all the list, Tom Wood. Trust them with one of the most critical parts of your driveline. And from now until the end of June, you can get 10% off your order using the exclusive Jeep Talk Show promo code. 
At checkout, just enter JTS18-1. That's JTS18-1, and you'll get the exclusive discount. Promo code is not valid with any other offer, discount, or promotion. It is only good until the end of June. Visit Tom Woods Custom Drive Shafts today. Go to www.4xshaft.com. Route 16 Off-Road brings you the best gear from the best brands in the off-road community, all in one place. From Power Tank to KC Highlights, Nitro, Crazy Beaver, Poison Spider to Rugged Ridge, Factor 55 to Yukon, even some Rubicon Express, you know Warren, Tuffy, and many more. As a community-focused brand, they sponsor some great events, clubs, and organizations, from the Uwari OHV Jamboree to the Myrtle Beach Jeep Jam. They're over at the Carolina Trails Off-Road Uwari Invasion to the Marine Recon Challenge. How about Top Sail Island Jeep Week in the 36 hours of Uwari Adventure Race? True Team Patriot. Chances are they're going to be at an event this year that you're attending, so make sure you stop by and say hi, or even order your next parts right there on the spot in their web orders tent. You can find Route 16 Off-Road on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even on Pinterest. Or just head straight to their website at Route16.com. That's R-O-O-T-O-N-E-S-I-X.com. Route 16 Off-Road. They live the Jeep life, too. Yeah, they do. You know, Josh, I always chuckle every time uh, I hear Crazy Beaver. It reminds me of the X. <laughs> <laughs> You got tech questions? Oh, boy, do I ever. We have answers. Oh, that's good. I can, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! Ordinarily, I do my best not to completely bore you or go too far over your head with technical jargon and terminology. Now, this week, instead of teaching you guys the ins and outs of the electrical system or troubleshooting a listener's engine problem, I thought I'd share with you guys one of those feel-good Jeep stories. And I do love me a good Jeep story. Now, don't worry. I think we can still find room to squeeze in a little tech talk in the story, too, as it does pertain to a Jeep's engine. Now, posted earlier on on social media uh, this week uh, by Chris Witt, the story reads, Earlier this week, a friend and customer, Jack, experienced a catastrophic engine failure in his Jeep Wrangler. His pride and joy, Buttercup, was down for the count. Having recently rebuilt every other portion of the drivetrain, Jeep funds were low, and obviously, so was Jack. Without his asking, Jack's friends stepped up to raise the money needed to repower Buttercup. Ronald TJ Jeep Kimberling of Mojo Jeep Shades put up some prizes and started a raffle. The goal was $3,500. Texas Borders Bar and Grill and Andrew Day of HB Graphics donated additional prizes to the raffle. ARW Off-Road and Performance and Michael Thomas, a.k.a. Mr. Fabricator, donated gift certificates to the raffle, too. In under 24 hours, all raffle tickets were completely sold out, and the goal of raising $3,500 was met. Absolutely amazing. They were not asked to do this. They did it because Jack's love for Jeeps and off-roading had brought them all together. Jack organizes charitable events for others on a regular basis, and they were proud to all get together and give back to him. Thank you, Jack Malfers, from your family. Under your guidance, we are proud to be Jeepers, West Houston Jeepers. Jack is, think, the, uh, Jack is the guy that I met whenever I went to the, uh, the local J- Jeep Jamboree, just about two, uh, uh, two or three miles here from the house. Uh, right. And uh, uh, he's a good guy. And uh, he, uh, I was just really uh, happy to see this posted on Facebook. It, it really surprised me. Uh, and then the other half uh, kicked in, and I was thinking, where the hell were you people uh, doing a raffle? Uh, and when I say you people, I don't mean these. I mean you listeners. Where the hell were you people not doing a raffle so you could buy my uh, Atlas uh, two-speed for oh, me? Oh, Tony. <laughs> it can be done. Tony. It can. It, this shows it can be done. Where Where is it for me? <laughs> what about me? <laughs> well, now this guy, this guy, I, I don't know what the catastrophic engine failure was. Now, the pictures that were associated with this post show a Jeep in some extreme rock crawling situations. Mm-hmm. This is a guy who has his Jeep and he does some very serious off roading with it. Now, with that comes some very extreme angles, a lot of articulation, and 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 really some some crazy, you know, really some crazy angles where you're going to likely lose some oil pressure multiple times throughout the run. And if you get in too much of an off-camber angle or, you know, off-camber situation to where, you know, that thing is is just way tilted up onto one side, there's a good chance that motor might be running for who knows how long without any oil in it, or at least without getting the circulation of oil that it needs. 
I see this stuff. I've, I've had this stuff happen to my, happen to me personally where, you know, I'm, I'm into some deep rocks and all of a sudden I, you know, boom, look down and my oil pressure is, is low. And so oh, I can give this a few more RPMs and, and, uh, you know, make that happen. Now, I don't know what, <laughs> if that was this or if it was, you know, something else, you know, maybe he, uh, got into some water and hydro, uh, hydro locked it. I, you know, I don't know, but nonetheless, catastrophic engine failure, that means, well, we can't, we're not just going to slap a new head on this or no. you know, replace the plugs or, you know, a sensor or something like that. This is a full engine swap situation. Yeah, uh, I'm just, it's been a few days since I read it, but I'm almost certain uh, Jack had written uh, in his post that uh, he had a, a, a engine cooling system failure and, oh. and he tried to get it to, uh, and I should have warned you before I mentioned that because I know it's still, it's been a year and a half or so, but it's still too soon because of your XJ overheating situation. I was going to say, I, <laughs> man, this is, I, I know all too well the pain this guy went through. I, I was borderline in his same situation. Yeah. So he, I think he, he milked it back, uh, off, he got off the trail and milked it back to, uh, where the campsite was or, or the, the rally point. And, uh, I think he had a knocking noise, uh, in the engine, uh, after this and, uh, had somebody look at it. Maybe it was Chris and it was like a not good situation. And if I'm if I'm correct, I believe Jack uh, mentioned that it was a stroker. So there was some oh. engine work that had already been done to this engine. Oh, that's uh, rough. I kind of gave him. He posted some stuff up in the uh, Western uh, West Houston Jeepers uh, uh, Facebook page today, and unrelated to anything going on with his with his Jeep. And I uh, took the opportunity to say, "Is it is it ready yet, Jack?" <laughs> You know, is it, it's only been about a week since they collected the money. He's like, is it oh, ready? Geez. Cause I know, I know how he feels, you know? Oh, sure. And, and there's something you left out here, jo- uh, Josh. Uh Oh, his Jeep is red. That's probably the most critical part of the story. And I just, I just want to tell you, it's a very okay. capable well, th- red th- th- Thanks Jeep. for pointing that out. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> that all the listeners are now better informed. And, uh, and they feel Lisa better about it. The, uh, <laughs> help, helps the mental image. You guys can picture this uh, this red Jeep just in crazy deep rocks. But, uh, well, that's cool. I'm glad that Jack got taken care of. And I, I really love hearing how, you know, local Jeepers come together to help out, you know, a fellow Jeeper, help out somebody who's active in the community and, and, and in the Jeep community and, and in his local community even – and it sounds like this guy's just salt of the earth kind of folk. So um, hats off to you, Jack, and, and hats off to your to your family, your Jeep family, yeah. uh, for stepping in and, and really showing what the Jeep Brotherhood is all about. Wait, what do you guys think? Let us know if you have a feel-good Jeep story. And, of course, I'm always taking suggestions for topics to cover on Tech Talk or specific problems to address even. Just jump over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and send us a message. You're listening to Jeep Talk Show, the number one Jeep podcast at my mom's house. Greetings, Jeep Talk. Super Croc again. So I've got a tip for, well, especially Tammy and I guess Josh as well. Now when you're camping and everything. Now this is going to be a great tip. So... Get your pen and paper ready. I'll wait just a second. It's building up. All right. <laughs> Got it? Yeah, Got it. I know. It takes forever to find, right? Oh, right here. Okay. So this tip will apply when you're camping or wherever you are. Same basic thing, okay? So what you need to do is build a temperature-controlled box, put it under your sleeping area, and then put some cheese in it. Mmm, I'm paying attention. That way you can be friends with the monster under your bed. Ah. Uh, oh, jeez. I know. Good Lord. Sage advice. You guys have a great day. <laughs> oh, Croc. <laughs> oh, that was a groaner, buddy. That was a groaner. And not a good and not in a good way. <laughs> oh, that I mean, a long way to go for <laughs> <laughs> uh no i love me some super croc though that, that yeah, guy yeah. every now and again he, he pulls out some gold and has a uh, great line of shoes from around the world or from your city and sometimes just down the street how to neighbor it's the jeep talk show interview Well, tonight we have Eric with Ocean 
State Jeepers uh, for our interview guest tonight. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for being with us. I know that you guys were uh, doing a big uh, Go Topless Day event, but we couldn't get you on uh, around that time, but we're having you on now. So uh, hopefully you're going to uh, clue us in a little bit on how your uh, Go Topless Day event went. So this was uh, went pretty well. Um, we had a little rain this year. It was our first year in, in seven years. But uh, but uh, Jeepers are a pretty hardy crowd, so we enjoyed about 500 Jeeps through the gate with a couple thousand people and uh, hundreds of Jeeps out on the trail all day. Pretty good day. So so this is, uh, when you say out on the trail, you guys actually do trail riding out there and not just uh, looky-loo on the beach? Absolutely. In fact, that's, that's, uh, that's really... You know, part of our core philosophy is is uh, getting people out on the trail. You know, a lot of a lot of Jeep uh, Jeep groups like having meet and greets and and those kinds of things, and those are all fine. But uh, for us, it's all about getting people out on the trail, especially new new people. There's nothing more rewarding, really, than having somebody that's just bought a Jeep and uh, out there for their first experience on the on the trail. That's really what it's all about for us. Oh yeah, I bet you see lots of big smiles on faces, and uh, and I'm sure a lot of uh, big eyes because they're a little uh, uh, concerned about doing things with their Jeep that they haven't done before. Well, that's 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 absolutely true, and uh, you know we we have trails of different ratings. You know we we say they're easy to to difficult, but even our easy trails, a lot of people come in thinking it's a uh, it's it's a uh, you know a drive down a dirt road, but we have obstacles out there that are. You know, it really requires four-wheel drive with spotters and and so forth. And uh, we get a lot of feedback, especially on our Facebook people, from some of the new new folks that say, "Oh, that was that was the hell of an easy trail." And uh, and then they start invariably they start talking about how they're going to modify their Jeep and be uh, more prepared next year. <laughs> Perpetuating the illness is what you guys are doing. Yeah, I got bit by the yep. bug. <laughs> So you guys, uh, Ocean Ocean State Jeepsters really are involved in a lot of. I noticed that you guys' uh, calendar page on your on your website, OceanStateJeepsters.com, has a whole list of events. I mean, you guys are pretty busy throughout the community throughout the year. It looks like. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, on average, somewhere between you know we 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 fix a schedule in November, you know, of each year for the following year, and typically shoot for somewhere between 35 and 40 events each year. And then sometimes we'll add, add a few along the way, even, and there's, there's a mixture, obviously trail rides that are primarily open to members are a big part of it. But, uh, you know, we also, we also do some social events. Pig roast is a, is a big favorite of ours and participating in 4th of July parades and various other you know, types of public relations and fundraising events just to, to get the message out there and let everybody know that, uh, you know, we're contributing members of the community as well. Yeah, I noticed that you guys uh, do an annual Earth Day cleanup. Uh, I, I would imagine that you guys, is it just like a stewardship with the trails that you guys run or is there, um, is there you know, more to it than that? Well, that's, that's certainly a big part of it. So there's uh um, I know some uh, management areas, obviously here in Rhode Island as well, and uh, you know the big river cleanup. It's one of the one of the larger management areas in Rhode Island, and we've been participating in this event for literally since the club's inception. We partner with the uh, West Greenwich Conservation Commission, so that's the the, the host town with primarily where the management area is located the New England Mountain Bike Association, and the Roadie Rovers, which is a motorcycle club. So we're the primary sponsors, um, partnered with the State Department of Environmental Management. We go out there and, uh, and do a lot of cleanups in the, in the management area. Um, and, and just a little bit more history on that, the, the management area itself used to be, um, uh, you know, historically it was, it was something before it was purchased by the state, um, there were a lot of private properties out there with private dumps, so um, tires, old vehicles, um, you know, and and just you know just household junk, bottles, and that kind of stuff. So over the years, we've hold, we've hauled literally hundreds of dumpsters of tires and that kind of stuff out of the property, and we've we've made a pretty good dent in it now, and it's it, it served us well. You know, we have good relationships with the state and these other user groups as well, so it's a very positive thing overall. 
Well, it sounds like it. And it sounds, uh, at least by the size of some of your guys' other events, that uh, a lot of people come out for these sort of things. So, so in terms of participation, absolutely. I mean, you know, many of our events are, are members only. We have almost 200 members in the club now. But, uh, wow. you know, these events like the cleanup and so forth are open to the public. And, uh, and uh, it's a good way to recruit people into the community. And, uh, you know, like for Go Topless Day, for example, people coming from as far away as New York and New Jersey. Um, so drawn from a pretty wide area. Now so, put that into perspective for for those of us living out here on the on the west coast. I mean, is that just like a, a half hour drive from where you guys are at, or are we talking like a ten hour drive to get to an event? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's a funny thing. Um, you know, Rhode Island is is about fifty miles by twenty miles, and uh, the town I live in is Exeter, and uh, it's about twenty miles from Providence and. You know, we often joke there's a lot of people in Exeter that have never been to Providence. So um, we definitely have a, a compressed length scale here in New England, <laughs> for sure. So, um, you know, maybe uh, four four to six hours is is probably the range from which we draw, I'd say. So if somebody wanted to become a, a member of, uh, of your group, how would they go about doing that? Is there any kind of requirements? In terms of becoming a member? Yes. So, you know, the, the club, our club, really has one main requirement, and that is you have to own a Jeep. Um, and then the other one is, is you have to be 18 years old. Um, after that, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, submit an application and then, uh, and then uh, show up. Because, <laughs> um, you know, that's really what it's all about for us is showing up. Yeah, participation. So, you know, we do have a membership cap. We try to limit our member membership each year and grow in a controlled fashion. But, uh, you know, that's, that's really what it is, is about, you know, getting people that show up. Um, not only do we do these events like this, but um, maybe you're not familiar with how land use and land access works here in, in New England, but uh, there's really no public property to speak of. It's all private property, so a big part of what we do is partner with with private landowners um, and help them manage their properties in, in exchange for uh, access and, and building trail systems. So that's another big part of what we do So and, when, uh, what we ask our members to participate in. Yep. So uh, when you say all you need to do is own a Jeep, is that anything with a Jeep logo? I mean, would that be the, the new Cherokee, the Renegade, uh, or do you guys uh, lean towards the JKs and you know, maybe the ones that have the solid front axle. Yeah. So, so no, it's, it's, it's really anything. Um, obviously Wranglers are, are dominant, but, uh, um, you know, I think we have a member with a Patriot right now and, uh, and, uh, some old school CJs, of course, and Cherokees are, uh, are pretty popular, especially with the younger crowds. And, uh, you know, and then we even, and many of our members are stock and a lot of them don't even, uh, necessarily go out on the trails that often and then uh, at the other end of the spectrum we have some some members whose uh quote unquote jeeps um don't have a whole lot of jeep left them i think one of the more extreme cases is a guy who started out with a cj and the only thing left now that's original is the is the uh is the gas pedal everything else is basically (laughs) a buggy (laughs) Well, there you hear it, guys. So if you're interested in getting involved in op- uh, Ocean State Jeepers, all you have to do is have a Jeep. So anything you like, you, if you'd like to get uh, involved in the Jeep life and the Jeep family, here's a, here's a great way to do it uh, up there in the, uh, the, the Northeast. So, Eric, let me ask you, you uh, general range of, uh, of members here, you said you guys have you know hundreds and hundreds of members, uh, hundreds of Jeeps, I mean, thousands of people coming to some of these events and whatnot. Um, what are the kinds of runs that you guys do? I mean, is it just a couple of, uh, of the locals that go out, or are we talking you know, 30, 40, 50 Jeeps all heading out onto the trail? So it, it depends. Um, you know, at some of our, our members-only events, They'll typically range anywhere from 15 to 50, um, and uh, and uh, typically, you know, we'll split into groups of maybe five to ten based on uh, you know vehicle capabilities, driver skill, and so forth, and then and then we'll head out and 
head out in our, our own directions during the day and then uh, typically meet up at the end of the day, either if it's a camping trip around the campfire or, you know, if it's just a day event or something at, uh, at a local watering hole for a burger and beer. Well, that all sounds like a lot of fun. Now, it, with as active as your guys' club is, I would imagine there's there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, and, of course, you know, with any club of this size, I'm sure there's, you know, management and, and a lot of other stuff that has to be taken care of. But how did this whole thing start to begin with? We, where did Ocean State Jeepsters come from? So, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty common story. Uh, just uh, a few guys that were sitting around one day and they, you know, we had Jeeps and, and uh, we said, let's form a club. <laughs> and we didn't really have a clue what we were doing at the moment, but uh, there was uh, a regional association called the Northeast Association of Four-Wheel Drive Clubs. So we, we hooked up with them, got some advice on, on how to organize and and uh, and so forth, which is, you know, involved in cooperating with the state and, uh, you know, becoming a legal entity and all that kind of stuff and uh, and, uh, and so forth. And then joining the, the association as well. And... Uh, you know, it started out small. I think there were 14 of us the first couple of years, and and over the last eight or nine years, it's grown to about a like 175 dues-paying members as of today. So, so Eric, yeah. I think that you left out the most important part of the you know get together of the men and the jeeps. There was also beer involved. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> but but always at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's another very important aspect. Right? Hey, um, let's start a club. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't we don't condone drinking on the trails and so forth. But uh, at the end of the day, we love sitting so there talking it, about it. We right? love beer. Yep. So uh, yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point. So if uh, if you're uh, uh, you're worried about uh, getting out there with the yahoos that are all liquored up on the trail, uh, you won't. It sounds like you won't have to worry about that with uh, with these folks. Yeah. In fact, you know, it's it's uh, you know we have a lot of the age range is quite quite wide as well you know we have members literally from 18 which is our youngest up to up to 80 and uh and uh, you know we've had a fair amount of success success um uh bringing some of the younger members into the into the crowd setting a, a good example for them and uh and so forth so that that's actually worked pretty well for us as well so eric let me ask you um when people get involved with the club all the time, you're talking about limiting, you know, limiting memberships and whatnot. And, and obviously I'm sure there was a lot of learning curves and, 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 you know, this whole thing was probably a big learning experience, starting up a club and whatnot, how to run it, what you do, you know, all the ins and outs and whatnot. Would you recommend anybody else going down that path or is, or is this like, you know, way more than you guys ever thought it was going to be? Well, if you mean, if it's way more work, so, so first of all, absolutely would recommend, I think it's, it's, it's really the, it's really the way to go, um, because when you when you when you have a club and like I mentioned earlier, the association that we belong to, um, it, it really gives you uh, another level of standing and credibility within you know the eyes of the public. So um, you know rather than just just being some random people that are enjoying the sport, it gives us a, a a good chance to. To help try to change some minds and and demonstrate that we're organized and so forth. So I think that's a that's a very important aspect of of being organized in the club is 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 the you know creating that perception in the eyes of the general public who oftentimes you know have a negative perception of what the sport is all about. Boy, don't they ever! I, I think that's you know, never more true than out here in Oregon. In fact, but you know, out here we have uh, the Pacific Northwest Four Wheel Drive Association, kind of a, a body similar to what your Northeast um, Association of Four Wheel Drive Clubs is. I would imagine um, they they help yep. a lot with uh, you know organizing um, events through multiple clubs in the, in the region and and uh, um, setting helping everybody just kind of get along basically because you know sometimes that you get two or three clubs that all want to do you know the same sort of thing at the same sort of time in the same sort of place you know do you guys run into a lot of that is is there a lot of club saturation out in the northeast there where you you have to kind of compete for dates for events and things like that so um yeah to a degree i um the the uh, no, the uh, the association here has 31 clubs and and, uh, and uh, it's actually a very a very tight knit organization 
And, you know, again, the primary reason I mentioned this earlier was, you know, the land access situation. It's primarily private property. So there's a lot of, a lot of collaboration between the clubs who, who go out and, and gain access to these properties. And then through the association, um, you know, we share them amongst each other. So we have systems set up where we can, uh, we, we, we can schedule events at these, at these various properties and, and uh, it gives us the opportunity for, for multiple clubs to, to participate in some of these events. For example, if, if our club is hosting an event on a certain day and, and members of another club want to participate, they're you know, pretty much always welcome to show up and, uh, and, uh, as well. So it's a, you know, it's, I think it's a, very, it's a very tight-knit cooperative situation here amongst the various clubs. So I was noticing uh, on your site that you have quite a few uh, uh, corporate uh, sponsors. Uh, would you like to tell us a, a little a little bit about those, which ones you have, and uh, uh, what they do with you? So, so sure. And um, and uh, I, I oftentimes hesitate to use the word sponsor. Um, it's more like these are there are companies that uh, you know support the sport. Um, and, and typically what that means is, is they, uh, you know, they, they'll show up to our events in many cases, or they'll make donations, um, raffle donations and things like that to, uh, you know, that we use to raise funds. And that's, that's actually another aspect of what we're doing up here is raising funds to buy land. Um, so, um, we have local sponsors, companies that are local to us here in New England, like Super Winch and Clayton Off-Road. Um, Crown Automotive are, are some of the some of the bigger names that are that are located here in uh, in uh, New England, um, and then there's you know obviously national national uh, ones things like Tom Woods, um, Rugged Ridge, all things Jeep um, is is another company that started here in New England. They're a, a Jeep Life and apparel um, retailer, and they're actually the the worldwide sponsor of Go Topos Day. So, um, and, and in almost all cases, the the people that run these these businesses are enthusiasts themselves, and they'll show up with their jeeps and so forth. And uh, you know, it's it's a, it's really just a win win situation. Yeah, I believe you also have uh, the one of our sponsors, uh, Extreme Terrain, that uh, helps uh, support you guys. Yes, Extreme Terrain. They're, they're fairly. I think it's fairly new, just a few years um, now since uh, we first we first hooked up with them, and uh, again, you know, very very supportive, um, and, uh, and and much appreciated. Oh, and Josh, here's one you're really familiar with and uh, have have done work with uh, four wheel drive. Yeah, let's see uh, what a parent company with uh, four wheel parts there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, involved with them definitely. I love those guys. I mean, you you definitely have a lot of you know big names behind you guys. I imagine that uh, that your fundraisers do pretty well. Uh, you guys with your with the the club base and and with as involved involved as you are in the community and with as much as you do for the community. You know, I bet there's a lot of giving back and stuff here. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that question. Well, I was commenting on on all the uh, you know the support that the club has with with you know all the members and with as vo- involved as you guys are in the community and everything that you do for the community. I would imagine there's a lot of giving back here, you know, from these local companies here, you know, towards your guys uh, you know ra- towards your guys's charities or you know whatever events that you're supporting and stuff. Oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. So, and there's really two aspects to you know to to what we what we do, you know, we do, uh, you know, we do fundraising in some cases for, for local charities, like, uh, in the case of Ocean State Jeepsters, Habitat for Humanity is, 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 is one of the, one of our favorite ones. But, uh, and it also, again, I keep coming back to the land use topic, um, you know, within the Northeast Association of Four Wheel Drive Clubs, you know, all of our member clubs um, are participating together to raise funds to acquire land. So not only do we partner with private landowners who let us use the land, but just just a couple months ago, we literally closed on the on our first property that was that was acquired by the clubs. So it's literally owned by a collection of clubs and available for use by all the clubs. So it's it's uh, kind of taking a page from the 
organizations such as the Nature Conservancy and Audubon Society, and when we're going after and acquiring our own land that's preserved with that twist of being uh, accessible to four-wheel drive enthusiasts as well. So we're, we're really thrilled about that acquisition, and we're actually have our eyes on acquiring some additional properties in the near future. So I was curious, what is your next big event, and uh, when is it scheduled? So in terms of club events, you know, we have our camping, uh, weekend camping event coming up later in, in uh, June. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty much all for club members. In, uh, in uh, August, we host what we call the Ocean State Jeep Festival. So partnership with Paul Bailey uh, Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram in North Kingstown, Rhode Island. They have some uh, land out behind their, their, uh, their uh, dealership, and we built a trail system there. So... It's not on Light Go Topless Day where it's open to the public and we invite uh, people in to come in and enjoy a day out on the trails. And then, uh, you know, uh, I hate to say it because we're still in spring, but uh, we're already looking forward to Fall Crawl, <laughs> which is which is a big event we host in, in, uh, in early September, um, a weekend event. So well, that's uh, about those the, are some of the big ones. That's about the time the snow hits up there, right? Yeah. yeah, well, not here in Rhode Island, maybe up a little further north, but yeah. Now, Eric, earlier yeah. you mentioned uh, Habitat for Humanity. Now, you guys have a, a big fundraiser that you do for them every year. In fact, you've got one coming up in July, I think, uh, here just around the corner, right? That's, that's correct. So it's, it's, it's July 28th this year. Um, it's, uh, it's organized by some of our members and, and who are also members of, of Habitat for Humanity. Um, this one actually is is one of our few events that doesn't really involve trail rides. It's and we we uh, work with some of the local motorcycle clubs as well. So it's a 60 mile uh, tour through through Rhode Island, some of the lighthouses along the coast, and then it culminates with uh, dinner and a raffle and some bands playing at Dance Place in West Greenwich, Rhode Island. It was a uh, first event was last year and it was a huge success and. Uh, uh, we're really looking forward to to an even bigger success this year. Well, if people want to get involved and if they want to find out more information about Ocean State Jeepsters or about this event, where can people go to uh, to get that information? So the probably the best place is to uh, find us on Facebook. It should be easy. You just type in Ocean State Jeepsters and uh, like the page, follow the page. Um, we update it regularly and. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with pictures and announcements and so forth about events. Um, and we also have a forum, uh, you know, a traditional bulletin board type forum. That's really limited to or targeted towards members and, and uh, prospective members and so forth. But that's out there as well. So two good sources of uh, information. And, of course, you guys can always find them over at OceanStateJeepsters.com. That's Jeepsters. There's an S and a T in there at the end there. OceanStateJeepsters.com. Of course, you can find their calendar of all their events there as well. Of course, Facebook, uh, find them there. And, uh, of course, if you want to get involved with their events, uh, maybe you'd like to donate to some of their great causes like the Habitat for Humanity fundraiser they have coming up in July. Well, by all means, reach out to them and see what you can do to help them out. Well, Eric, we certainly appreciate your time tonight, and uh, thank you for filling in for uh, JJ. And uh, don't forget, throw uh, throw JJ under the bus for the next one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. Got to give big thanks again out to Eric for taking the time to uh, fill in for JJ, of course, and uh, also talk about their Go Topless Day event, all the other cool stuff that Ocean State Jeepsters do. Now, hey, do you guys have an idea for a guest? Well, we want to hear from you. There could be somebody out there that we just haven't thought of yet, and, well, maybe you want to be a guest on the Jeep Talk Show. Well, just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. You'll find all the ways that you can reach out to us and let us know what you're thinking and who could be on our show and well, of course, you can give us your personal information, and we'll reach out to you and set things up. Hey, coming up next week, we've got Jason Koch with Planet JP to talk about Destiny Matters, Teenage Suicide Prevention Parade, happening in McGregor, Texas on July 21st. This should be interesting because they're trying to beat the number of Jeeps that the now world-famous Bantam Jeep Festival had at a count of 2420. That's 2,420. You know what the... <laughs> 
You know what they say, everything is bigger in Texas. This is a heck of a goal, and there's a great cause behind it. So be sure and stay on the lookout for episode 337 to hear all about it. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And uh, in my spare time, I picked up a job uh, announcing horse races. And uh, so here's a clip from uh, latest race. And here we are at the first ever Who Will Hit the Trails First race. <laughs> and they're off. And in the lead, it's Tony with his shiny new Atlas 2 speed. Pulling up behind him is Josh coming off a three year build problem and the shame <laughs> of driving a Honda. They're rounding the second corner. They're neck and neck. But wait, what's this? Coming up on the inside, it's Super Croc. No one knows what he drives or if he even has a driver's license, but he's pulling up strong. They're rounding the home stretch, all three neck and neck. Who's going to win? Who's it going to be? It's Super Croc by a mosquito's length. Oh, the humanity. <laughs> and you know the mosquitoes, uh, in word Super Croc is, is the state bird. Yeah, so this right. is big. That's a big lead. <laughs> Oh, good times. Good times. Production from Nikki G. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Yeah, it was a good job, Nikki. Good job. Nikki sends me an email. He goes, I'm going to try something. So I took that as to be the podcasting equivalent of hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. Yeah, no, I, I am. I am. Uh, I'm getting upset about how long this this thing is taking. But uh, but hey, we can get in that into some uh, campfire side chat. Oh, speaking of which. Yeah, I had a number of listeners actually uh, put me on blast, as it were, uh, about this transfer case um, <laughs> and, and how long it's taken me to rebuild this damn thing. Uh, but really, you know, I, I've, I've told you guys, it's a, just a matter of time. I'm, I'm, I'm a busy guy. I don't have a whole lot of spare time, especially for, you know, hours of, uh, of resetting gears and that sort of stuff. So um, it's just a, a matter of time. But unfortunately, time is ticking. I've got some events coming up as we are, well, we're well underway into the wheeling season. And, uh, well, my Jeep is still apart. So, uh, and I've got some events here in the Northwest that I am planning on attending on behalf of the show. So I really got to get my butt in gear. Uh, and speaking of gear, I've got some more gears to put together. So, uh, Hey, I'm, I'm taking off. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, I was, we were talking about stickers today and about, um, uh, me placing a big sticker order. Um, this reminds me, I did not get a chance to send out the stickers to you this uh, past long weekend I had with my days oh, no, off. Oh, no, I really am quitting. All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> but, but I'm definitely going to send you some uh, here. Uh, I'll try to do it this weekend. Uh, when, when's the event coming up? Uh, I think my, my first one is on the 16th. Okay, so I should be able to get that to you in plenty of time. So uh, you'll be able to get uh, some uh, nice Jeep Talk Show stickers. And these are the ones... Uh, with the the patriotic uh, Jeep Talk Show stickers and also to the uh, the black on white uh, Jeep Talk Show stickers, uh, and and we made a little modification to them. They now have the uh, website information uh, on it as well. Something Josh was uh, complaining to me about from five Endlessly. years ago. <laughs> no, I, I riding his butt on this almost every day. <laughs> I'm like, they can do a Google search. We're all over the web. All they have to do is type <laughs> in Jeep can't. Talk Show, and they'll get the the website Seriously. information. So can't miss us. So anyway, uh, uh, dragging and screaming. I finally made the stickers the way Josh told me to do. Uh, to, <laughs> told me to do it. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot about this, Josh. And uh, this I thought was pretty funny. Uh, and you'll like hearing about this. So, oh, your Atlas? Uh, no, we haven't heard anything about it. Well, recently. You, don't wait a second. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> like this. So uh, I'd been uh, posting about the Atlas on the Jeep Talk Show. Shocking! Show. Shocking! <laughs> <laughs> the Jeep Talk Show group, not to be confused with the Jeep Talk Show page. And one of the updates I did was I can't lift this damn Atlas up into place. I can't use the the jack, you know, the hydraulic jack to uh, lift it up into place. It's just too hard to handle. It's just too bulky and heavy. Now, if another person had been there with me, uh, I think that uh, two men could have could have done it. 
So mm-hmm. uh, I actually got the uh, got my daughter and my my wife went with her to go down to a Harbor Freight, which is maybe I don't think I've ever been into the store, but uh, it's <gasps> it's maybe like two two miles from the house or maybe three we're miles. We're going to talk about the uh, the validity of your man card here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not hey, been in a Harbor Freight store. I had to, not to, not to do doing too much Amazon plugging here, but I always get everything off of yeah. Amazon. <laughs> but I'm you know I'm trying to get this Atlas installed, so I, I and you know I need something now, so. Uh, I went over there and, and and looked at the uh, transmission jack that I had looked at before that was a hundred bucks, and somebody else had mentioned you know do yourself a favor get you the transmission jack from Harbor Harbor Freight it's like eighty bucks and you had mentioned it in a show like uh, don't even try it without a transmission jack get a transmission jack so anyway I posted on there that I'm uh, you know here's where I am and I'm waiting for uh, the fam to get back with the transmission uh, jack and I think it was Nate uh, said. Uh, you were clearly told this by Josh in the last episode. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Josh isn't the boss of me. Yeah. <laughs> I can do whatever the hell I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Uh, it doesn't matter if he's me. right. <laughs> in fact, that's why I'm going to try and do it the way I want to do it. Damn it, yeah. is because I don't want him to be right. <laughs> You guys know how it is. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so I I, uh, I got that uh, $100 transmission jack, and I, as I told them, it's not something I'm ever going to use again. If I use it in the next 10 years, I'll be surprised. So I've got this this other item uh, laying in my garage, and, and actually I've got the 242 strapped to it right now. So it's basically a 242 dolly that I can move the 242 around. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, I'll tell you this, though. I was really surprised at how it held that Atlas. It's it, it's an inexpensive piece of uh, equipment, but it's very well made. It's very sturdy. And even with it being extended uh, a, a good uh, over 2 feet uh, up into the, you know, the cavity of the of the Jeep, uh mm-hmm. it was very stable. Uh it was you know, I think a really good piece of equipment. So um I can't remember uh the name brand right now. I'll have to put that in the show notes. So if somebody else is pointing on uh, doing any go. kind of transfer case stuff. Now, the when I removed the uh, the 242, uh, it wasn't that difficult to handle. But we're talking about a difference of about 40 pounds, I think, Ooh, with, between the yeah, two. Yeah, that's that's enough, especially when you're like you know on your back and you're trying to you know one knee and an elbow and you're trying to get that up and you know yeah no there's there's no way. Now I think that if if I had had the Jeep on a lift. Uh, it still would have been very difficult to pick up the transfer case and then lift well, it yeah, up and above you're my head. Dead lifting it at that point, yeah, you don't know Olympic weightlifter over there. It's well, it's it's just a little over a hundred pounds. Jerk. Yeah, you, you know, uh, it's a family show, Josh. And I, I think that it would have been easier. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have been easier to actually lift it up into place. And certainly, if you had a buddy uh, that uh, that was uh, there to, to spot you, yeah. so to speak, it, it makes it a lot easier too. But anyway, so, look- it's in. Let me let me ask you though. Um, did did you try it with the with the floor jack? I mean, trying to get the the atlas balancing on it, maybe with one hand and kind of you know jacking it up in position with the other, kind of getting it close enough to where you can get underneath of there and finish the job. I mean, where what was it? Was it even a even something that was on the radar? Or no, no, it was it was attempted I think twice, and I actually got Mandy, uh, my youngest daughter, to come out there and actually do the jack so I could put both hands. Oh. On the yeah. transfer case, and it's the, just too and, much to. Too well, much the, to the main problem around. is is the clocking. Now, if you just had it, uh, if you just had it clocked at, at you know like zero degrees, you just mm-hmm. bum 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 and and you know uh, and and stab it. But the clocking uh, is is so what like twenty three degrees or something like that. So you have to tilt that thing. So now not only are you, um, uh, I mean the the jack is lifting it, but now you're holding it from sliding off that yeah. little plate and there's no way to, to strap it to this small little area that the the jack uh i mean the the two inch or three inch uh, diameter uh circle that uh, is the, the the surface point the lifting point of the jack so it it just wasn't it just wasn't in the cards and it took a long time with the transmission jack because i'd have to lower it down put some shims in there raise uh. it back up and see how i was matching up with the the transmission uh, spline mm-hmm. and all the 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 six goddamn holes uh the going into the the with the studs going into those holes and i just kept messing with it and, and finally uh it, it you know i got enough in there and it i i did i did strap it down so it wouldn't move on me because that's that's very right. infuriating is when you get it shimmed 
and then you're raising it up and you, I'm using the Balls impact. <laughs> well, I'm using the impact and that impact is a hammer and it's boom, 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 oh, boom, boom, boom. So it yeah, makes the shims yeah. move. So, uh, you know, it, it all in all, when it worked, it was great. Uh, but there was a learning curve of uh, all these things. You can't, you really just can't manipulate it once it's, it's up there. You need to have it uh, tied down in place at the right clock. And, you know, if I had uh, gotten some sort of an ankle finder and did all that stuff and, and did it perfectly, but uh, I didn't, I, I probably, it probably took me five or six attempts to get it clocked properly before it just oh went my. in. And I was, I was smart enough to put the, uh, the, uh, uh, to engage uh, the, the Atlas so that it was in two wheel drive high. So once I got it up there, because the, the spline from the transmission sticks out further than the, the studs uh, for the holes. And once I got it in there close enough, I could move the, the, the flange on the back of the transfer case to see if I was engaged on the, ah, the transmission shaft. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't an afterthought, which I'm really impressed that I actually oh, thought about doing it before. <laughs> because if it, was, if it was in neutral, you're just, it, you don't know. It's yeah, just going to be spinning. So right. once it locked into place, I went, God damn it, uh -huh. and just pushed it. <laughs> and it went in, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. It was in. I mean, we're uh, talking, the, a, the, we're talking the a couple of hours. Fist, the emotional fist pump that, that happened immediately when that thunk and it, I kind of dropped into position there. It was like uh. it was like being 16 and having your first sexual experience. <laughs> <laughs> and don't not and don't not hearing and not hearing that's not it. <laughs> but anyway, I got a a nut on the, a different I'm going back to the transfer case now. I got a nut on that uh, say, on that one shows. bolt. Yeah. I got the, <laughs> I got a nut on that one bolt and laid there. Panting, just like the sixteen-year-old experience. Just yep. like the sixteen-year-old, <laughs> sweating, but, laying there confused. But damn it, I would have paid serious money for the Atlas install to have been longer than forty-five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it, how long have you sat in the seat then, just playing with your twin sticks? This is getting really out of control here. <laughs> you know. When you when you uh, you order the Atlas, you think and you see the pictures of it, and it's just beautiful. It's a custom made, beautiful piece of equipment that that rock bouncers use. And you know, you wait for it. It comes in. You see it. It's wonderful looking. It's heavy as hell. And you know, it's just pure beef. And uh, I just gotta play this. <laughs> it's just wonderful beefy stuff. And, uh, but then, you know, you think about it, you're never going to see this again. Nobody is going to see this unless you're up on a rock. And even then they're probably not going to see it because it's going to get dingy. Mm -hmm. The thing that you're going to notice. And, and when I say that you're, I mean, me is those twin sticks. So I was really interested in seeing what it looked like. What's it going to be like, uh, to have those twin sticks there. And it is so cool. It is just so cool. It, 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 it screams custom. Now, I asked you a question off the air uh, through chat uh, earlier in the week about, you know, kind of positioning and stuff like that. And, and from a, a normal driving position, having those twin sticks there, because there's a lot more sticking up through the floorboard than there was with the factory transfer case. Oh, God, it, yes. Are, is anything getting in the way? I mean, do you have something jamming into the side of your knee or, you know, oh, every time you go over a pothole, you're going to end up with a bruise in your thigh? I mean, is it, or, or are they out of the way? I mean, is it ergonomic with the, having this atlas in there? I don't understand why this the sticks aren't straight. Um, I I don't know why they've got bends and things in them. They they actually seem to go out of the way of bending the uh, the front axle stick in a in a way that it's going to come in contact with the rear axle uh, stick. Where if it was the straight, um, it, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't. I don't think that would happen. It, the the balls on top. Uh, the shifter knobs may may touch. May, maybe that was part of the problem. Um, mm. But yes, uh, the uh, and, and actually, I was. Uh, uh, have you ever driven a Fiero? Do you remember the Fieros from the eighties? I do remember the Fieros. I've worked on on a couple back in the day, uh, doing some electrical work for them. But I've never really driven them around. I, I test drove one. Uh, yeah, I'm that old. Uh, I test drove one, and the thing that surprised me was the the not the column not the center console but basically that the hump in the middle you know where the transmission mm -hmm. the driveline goes through yeah it was really strange because i couldn't see the gas pedal 
that thing was so wide oh. and so weird. I think it had to do with because it was a, a short plastic, basic, basically car, and they probably mm-hmm. had the, the 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 motor pushed way back in there. I couldn't see the gas pedal. I actually had to put my foot around this thing and feel for the gas pedal. Well, driving yeah. driving the, the 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 Cherokee with the twin sticks reminds me of that because oh. I can't just spread my legs and then easily put my foot on the gas pedal. I have to mentally uh, figure out my way to the gas pedal. I can still see it, of course, but it re- reminded me a lot of that uh, Fiero test drive. Um, so the plans this weekend uh, are to now now the the shifter linkage has heat shrinkable tubing on the linkage adjustment and the way they the reason why they do that is they want the linkage to be able to move but you don't want the the all the all thread to back out and then you can't shift right so they give you the heat shrinkable tubing so i put the heat shrink tubing on there but it did not shrink it yet and because i figured there's going to be some adjustments so anyway, yeah. this weekend I'm going to be put, taking off that uh, front axle uh, shifter stick and put it in the vise and bending the crap out of it. <laughs> oh, might might I recommend a little bit of heat? It will probably make things a lot easier on you. Um, I don't know if the black is painted or if it is uh, all powder coated. If it, if it's just black. And I don't think that uh, I don't think I'll need any heat for it. To be honest with you, oh, okay. uh, it's pretty it's pretty long. And as long as I protect uh, the the finish in the vise and put a long enough rod uh, on the I end was going to say it, if you have like a you know your your jack handle breaker that's bar exactly some what kind, I was thinking. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you'll get the you'll get the leverage you need. You're right. You probably won't need any heat. I don't need to move it very much uh, because I don't want to I don't want to have the the uh, the knobs uh, coming into contact with one another. Uh, but I just need a little a little relief. It's a it's maybe an inch is what I got to move it. I don't mind it being on my leg. In fact, I I, I kind of think of it as the the Atlas trying to you know I'm driving so it doesn't want to hold my hand. So it's, yeah. just, it's just putting a hand on my leg just to let me know it's just, there. Just resting it there. Yeah. yeah just so, Hi, dear. So you know. I'm right. I'm here with you. I'm here. I love I'm here. you. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're killing me, Smiles. So killing I don't me. necessarily want to lose that relationship <laughs> that has been developed, and you know the reaching out of the Atlas to me. So uh, it, it's it's nice to be loved. Uh, but yeah, so um, that's the plan. And uh, but the the linkage is pretty well shifted. Uh, I mean, pretty well in the right place. Oh, I tore the boot. So oh, oh. well it, that the hole. I got I got a complaint. The boot that they send you with the kit, it's not big enough. Because the size Uh-oh. of the hole that you got to cut, it, it, it doesn't fill that uh, that void properly. In fact, I used an old mouse pad to cut a piece of an old, old mouse pad to, to uh, fill in a little uh, sliver of opening that I was un- unable to cover. So that Aww. basically means that I've ordered another boot. The, it's it's on 24 bucks on Amazon. It's the same damn boot. Uh, I think it's um, Om- Omnix or whatever it's called uh, that uh, that sells it. So that should be in Saturday. So that means the console is going to be coming back out and uh, I'm going to be uh, putting the new boot in there. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm the, using the mouse pad uh, idea. I think I'm going to take the leftover piece of mouse pad, cut around an oval circle in it and then mount that. Uh, and then mount, I mean, mount the boot and the ring to the top of it. Mm. And then that will be, saying. it'll be a nice, um, uh, a nice platform for it to sit on. And also too, it'll be uh, cushy. Uh, and I was going to say, almost like, like a little you know, foam gasket kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's like a neoprene uh, type material. So it should do yeah. well with, uh, with liquid, with water and stuff too. So um, right now what I've been doing is you can hear the, uh, the slight, uh, you know, that new um, uh, header that I put on the, uh, the 4.0 six months eight months ago it has yeah. a leak so i can hear that leak real good uh coming oh. up through the torn boot so i've been taking a towel and sticking it on there um that's kind of the interesting thing about the the twin sticks you never use them if you're yeah. if you're driving to and from work you never use them no you, only you, off-road you can touch them you can pat them you can do you know polish them if you like <laughs> but there's, <laughs> there's there's nothing you can do with which them, tony so. has done extensively uh, since he's had that in there, so much fun. It it was a great modification. Uh, it, it it's it's just a lot of fun having it in there. Uh, I'm really looking forward to using it. 
Well, if you've had it up to here with the Atlas Talk, uh, then let us know. <laughs> Head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Find out all the ways that you guys can join in on the fun with the campfire side chat. We'd love to have you on the show and, and, and sharing your Jeep story and whatnot. There's always room around the campfire, so reach out to us and, uh, and let us know if you'd like to join in and be a part of the show. Guys, let's talk about some events that are coming up in your neck of the woods and around the nation. Now, if you are into less of the rock crawling and more into the uh, overlanding, well, then you're going to need to know about this event. It's happening June 28th through July 1st. This is the Northwest Overland Rally. That's happening just off of Beaver Valley Road in Leavenworth, Washington. Now, there's going to have they're going to have a game show, nightly campfire, huge raffles, tons of presenters and exhibitors, trail runs, instruction classes even some ladies only classes uh, out there for the wives and whatnot family spotting classes morning yoga how about that great way to wake up and uh, get a little stretching going before you hit the trails lots more for more information on this head over to our website we'll have a link in the show notes for this episode second annual ohio jeep fest is happening july 6th through the 8th at the ross county fairgrounds in chillicote ohio Geez, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, for more information on this, head over to OhioJeepFest.com. Oh, by the way, Colt Ford is going to be in concert at this one. Huge, guys. Something for everybody. Huge family-friendly event. Uh, mud pit, obstacle course, beer garden, on-site camping, tons of stuff. Ohio Jeep Fest is where it's at. Uh, 66th annual Jeepers Jamboree happening July 26th through the 29th. Full guided and supported trip through the world-famous Rubicon Trail. Guys, if you want the ultimate in a jeeping experience, this is it. We're talking about bucket list jeep adventures, guys. The the, the January the annual Jeepers Jamboree is an event that you don't want to miss. Add a, add this to your list of must have experiences uh, being a jeep owner. And for more information, head over to JeepersJamboree.com. Oh, I'll mention real quick something I forgot about until uh, uh, Josh was uh, talking about the events. Uh, I did mention about uh, letting you guys know uh, ahead of time about maybe a, a, a run out to uh, Barnwell or one of the, the parks here in Central Texas. Um, and uh, things are looking good for that. Now, I don't have the front drive shaft yet. It's supposed to be in on Tuesday. So uh, uh, with as many problems as I've had with uh, popping chains and not having one now, I'm still concerned that there's going to be some other four-wheel drive problem <laughs> but once i get the drive shaft in and and test out the four-wheel drive we're going to be seriously talking about uh, doing some uh doing a trip up uh to uh, central texas if you guys would like to be a part of that i'd love for you to come out i'll bring some uh some stickers and uh, uh we can talk and uh, have a good time maybe record a little audio so just want to give you a heads up on that uh still planning on doing that uh, my goal is to uh, make sure I get out on the trail before Josh gets his 242 back together. <laughs> now, likely you will, too, at the, at the rate that I'm going. Good Lord. <laughs> well, it'll just be a motivation uh, for you, uh, Josh. Hey, note of an off-road event coming up? Well, shoot us an email with some details. Have you been to a Jeep event recently? Well, we'd love to hear from you and find out how it went. Just go to our contact page at jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out the ways that you can reach out. Hey, don't forget, if you need a voice for your product or your business or even any educational material, I offer professional voiceover services at thevoiceofjosh.com. Be sure to check me out there. That's it for this week, guys. Until next week, be sure to follow, friend, like, subscribe, and above all else, be sure to tell a friend about the one and only Jeep Talk Show. So no matter where you are wheeling, if you pack it in, pack it out, and don't wheel where you're not supposed to. Remember to always tread lightly. If you'd like to learn more about the Tread Lightly principles, head over to treadlightly.org. Warning, this is a test of the emergency Jeep talk show. This is only a test. Had this been an actual Jeep emergency, you would have been instructed to get off-road as soon as possible. Again, this is only a test. Podcasting since 2010.